Hello friends, my name is Jonah Jackson. I'm the Game Master on Quest Company Jr., an actual play RPG podcast that's fun for the whole family. You can join us for fun adventures in our series, Guardians of Greenwood and Postcards Yo, from Pearl. Are you talking about me? Oh, uh, hey Pearl, yeah, I was just about to tell oh, him all oh, about oh, I you. I want to help. My name is Pearl. I'm 10 years old. I'm a super cool Pokemon trainer. My best friend is a seal named Sealy. Or Ord? I'm exploring the Kanoko region to become the very best like no one ever was. Oh, yeah, Kanoko is a brand I'm new region. I'm making a lot of new friends, and I'm trying to take down Team Nasty. Well, those guys are no good. Yeah, they steal Pokemon and turn them into shadow Pokemon. What the heck? Well, if there's anyone who can stop them. It's a 10-year-old who was raised on a cruise ship. Or, or. Okay, Sealy and I are going to go train. See you later. Bye, Pearl. If you want to follow Pearl's Adventures, check out Quest Company Jr. wherever you get your podcasts. Quest Company Jr. Fun at the table, fun for the family. The folklore in Kid Cryptid wouldn't exist if it weren't for the rich history and vibrant cultures these stories come from. While we do our best to provide accurate information, we recognize that we are, at best, amateurs here. This podcast is best considered for entertainment purposes only, and it comes from a place of love and respect for the peoples behind the lore. Now, on with the show. I'm Elias. I'm Sean. And you are listening to Kid Cryptid, the podcast where we talk about those evasive and mysterious creatures known as cryptids. How's it going, Elias? Good. You ready for today's Fallout 4 show? I know you're not talking about Fallout 4 today. Okay, you're right. We're not talking about Fallout 4 today. We are, however, going to be talking about a big, fiery, hot topic near and dear to my heart. Any ideas what that could be? I think I know something that breathes fire. Yep, put on your shiniest armor and grab your sword and shield. For today, we go on a quest and there be dragons. All right. So this is going to be a pretty big topic, literally and figuratively. See, long before movies about how to train them, or people rolled dice through dungeons, or Tolkien told of Smaug devastating the Lonely Mountain, people all around the world have told stories about dragons. It's nearly impossible to know when and where the first story originated, but the first written evidence dates back to ancient Greece and Samaria. This creates a lot of ground to cover, so this is going to be a very broad overview. Otherwise, we run the risk of becoming the Kid Dragon Podcast. Yeah, the Kid Dragon Podcast. That's not a catchy name. Not as catchy, no. You're right. Now, before I continue, why don't you go ahead and describe a dragon to me? What do they look like? Well, so I know that um, in the medievals, dragons are supposed to be um are supposed to be like on top of towers and stuff like that and um they have spikes on their backs they have huge wings they have a long tail a long neck they have a i think a face that is technically like a it's almost like a horse except lizard like and then they breathe fire they um they have sharp teeth and they have claws on their feet and that's technically all so that was a pretty good description the only thing is though it describes one type of dragon remember how i said that there are stories of dragons that come from all over the world like chinese and other stuff like that yep it means that dragons look like Yep, it means that what a dragon looks like it depends on where you're coming from. So wait, are you telling me that we have a mythological uh, dragon in our area? No, not in our area. Oh. But what I was saying is you gave a pretty solid description of a Western or European dragon. However, as you kind of alluded to, in China, for example, it wouldn't be out of place for a dragon to be described as long slender-bodied with legs and no wings, and more of a lion-like head. Yeah, I know that, but, like, um, I think they, like, have magic in them, so that way they can fly. Okay, we'll get into that a little bit later, too. In Central America, you'll hear stories of Quetzalcoatl, 
the Aztec god of wind and air, who had a serpent-like body and feathered wings. Oh. India has the Naga, which look like humans from the waist up, but like a snake from the waist down. I don't want to see that. That does not look pleasant in my brain. And that's only just to name a few. Oh. This makes for some beautiful artwork throughout the course of history, though. So I highly recommend looking for dragons online and not just stopping with modern fantasy art. Not that there's anything wrong with modern art. I'm just saying there's a lot more out there. So you can imagine with all the different cultures involved that dragons take on a wide variety of roles. Yeah. Again, with what you know, are dragons good or evil? I think they're in the middle. I mean, some dragons are good, some dragons are evil. You never know. I really like that answer. It was a trick question anyway. Because it all depends on the dragon and the culture. I mean, um, I think I got a dangerous tip. tip if you see, like, human bones around their territory. You better start running for your life. And if you don't see anything... That does not look unpleasant. They just they just go up. So in Europe, they developed a decidedly evil reputation. While they had existed in stories long before Christianity took hold, and they weren't always evil creatures, religious leaders adopted the dragon as a symbol of the devil. The fire breathing and the fiery mouth being representative of the very gates of hell. To Europeans, dragons became little more than monsters to slay in the name of God. The story of St. George the Dragon Slayer is a perfect example for that kind of story. In many ways, it becomes the archetype of the kind of story where you have a princess that needs rescuing by a heroic knight. Chinese dragons, on the other hand, were viewed with much more reverence. They were believed to be symbols of justice and extremely intelligent. In many cases, they were considered godlike themselves. Emperors looked to copy these qualities in how they ruled. Unfortunately, this also meant they could be fierce and brutal. And being human, those qualities came out frequently. But that's a much different matter and one that starts to get out of my depth. The main thing to take away is that dragons could be good, evil, or all the things in between. In a lot of ways, that makes them very human. Yep. But, uh, so, you know how I said lizard-like for dragons? Yeah. There actually is a lizard that is called the Komodo dragon. We get to that, too. Yeah. You're you're jumping up ahead a little bit. I'm good with dragons. Now, did you also know that some dragons could take on human form? Uh, no, I did not. Yeah, so flying and fire-breathing are big claims to fame but they were frequently given other powers as well. In Greek mythology, their teeth could be planted like a seed in the ground, and they would grow into armed warriors. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so you could grow a whole army if you had a bunch of dragon's teeth. I just want to go try to find if I can see a dragon, which I'm probably not going to find. And, And I can plant an army that will guard our house. Before the arrival of Christianity, the ancient Celts believed that dragons could see the future. And as time has moved on and the fantasy genre has gained popularity, dragons have gained all sorts of traits and powers. The How to Train Your Dragon books are a practical encyclopedia in their own right when it comes to modern dragon lore. It's a bit of a random question that you kind of hit on a little bit earlier. Yeah. How do you think dragons fly? Uh, I mean, yeah, some have wings. We got that. But not all of them. Some don't have wings. And they might no, have magic. They might have magic. Uh, the Flight of Dragons has a pretty good idea. Do you remember that movie? Yes. Uh, oh! By, in the Flight of Dragons, they said that they would use materials, and they would eat it, and then... Yeah, it's like the, the limestone they ate created a gas in their bellies that helped them fly. And they used the fire to burn it off so they could come back down. Yeah. So basically, it's like their belly is a hot air balloon. Kinda. And I'm going to take a moment to plug that movie. Kids, if you haven't read or seen The Flight of Dragons, bug your parents about it. I loved it when I was younger and I still enjoy it. And me too. 
So after talking about all of this, I guess we should go ahead and state that I don't think the dragons are real. As much as I would love for them to exist, the possibility is just too low. A large, sentient, flying, fire-breathing creature would be really hard to miss. But why do you think people have believed in dragons since ancient times? Myths have come about as ways to explain the world around us, so there had to be something to spark the idea. And while they may not meet the criteria for cryptids today, they definitely did for a good portion of human history. And as far as I'm concerned, that still counts. For example, in 1640, a European naturalist wrote about the winged dragons flying through Africa that beat enormous animals such as bulls to death with their tails. Um, I think I know where you're going here. Do you? Yeah, the Komodo dragon. I know that it eats meat, so they have a long tail. They are very strong. We're not quite to there yet. What, what else do you think, though, that people could have found that would have caused them to think dragons were a thing? The answer, in my opinion, is still pretty cool. I don't know. <laughs> dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. Now, I'm not suggesting that people and dinosaurs lived at the same time. They didn't. Well... I'm talking about their bones. They're... People have been finding fossils for thousands of years. To give an example, a town in Austria used to keep a woolly rhinoceros skull in the town hall though it was claimed to be the skull of a dragon slain before the city was founded in 1250 BC. It wouldn't surprise me at all if we've been telling stories about dragons since we developed the ability to talk, because we've been finding giant bones. So, hold up. Are you telling me that people thought that a woolly mammoth was a dragon that had tusks? The skull? Have you seen a woolly mammoth skull? Yeah, but usually they have dragons have horns, not tusks. Well, and remember, though, how I said that dragons look like different things to different people? Yeah, but... And we're also talking that that was thousands of years ago. We actually have some fossils in, I'm pretty sure, our region. Like a woolly mammoth. Yes, we do, but <laughs> we have a bunch of those in this area. But that's a, that's a whole different matter, and those are still pretty cool. But I'm still saying that a dragon came from the Komodo... Well, okay, but what about, like, a T-Rex? Look at a T-Rex skull and look at a picture of a dragon. You can see where that inspiration comes from. But they don't have wings! Yeah, but if all you found is a giant skull with, like, massive teeth in it, you're gonna make up a story to fit the rest of it. And try to plant teeth in the ground. And yes, you are also correct. There are living animals today that could easily lend themselves to that legend. The Komodo dragon doesn't get its name by accident. But it also doesn't have wings. I know, but, like, I think I know why it has a dragon name. It doesn't breathe fire, either. It's a lizard. Almost looks like a dragon. Has a long tail. And also eats meat. And it can eat people. That is true. Have you ever seen, like, the one that's in the zoo? That's pretty big. I have seen that. Yeah, it's scary. So, what do you think? Could Nessie be a dragon? Maybe a sea dragon. Ooh. that's We didn't even touch on that. Yeah, I don't know if actually sea dragons are a thing. Why wouldn't they be? I mean, they live everywhere else in the world. Why wouldn't they live... Actually, I'm getting a thing now that sea dragons could actually be real because, uh, you know those dinosaurs... That lived under the sea, and they had those long necks on their other side, and they had the tail on the other side, and the flippers? Those yeah. could, like, make sea dragons. I believe those are plesiosaurs? Yeah, plesiosaurs. That we thought Nessie war was. But dragons have always just been a really popular thing for me, because I've always been a Dungeons & Dragons player. So, I can just remember looking through the Monstrous Manual and reading about all the different kinds of dragons there. I'm usually the one that tries to cite it. Do what? I'm usually the one that's trying to, like, find if it's real, because I want to be a scientist. Ah. Uh, okay, so that's why you should like Flight of Dragons, then, because it gives a scientific reason for dragon flight. 
Yes. Now, before we wrap up, I want to touch on some cultural notes I picked up on while doing some research. The term dragon is used very loosely here to describe large reptilian creatures with seemingly magical powers. While we here in the U.S. especially like to lump all these things together, I do want to point out that what we consider a dragon may not be viewed that way in other cultures. Mm-hmm. Naga, for example, are viewed as a completely separate type of creature in India. So for ease of accessibility, I did not differentiate here. But I do just want you to know that other places don't consider the same things to be dragons. Like even China, like what we consider to be like a Chinese dragon, they really don't like terming it as dragon. I mean, it sort of does look like a snake almost. Yeah, so I I can get where the confusion happens and it's kind of a breakdown in language and culture and everything else. But for ease of stories here, I'm including Nagas, I'm including Wyverns, dragons, you name it. All of those kind of... Chinese dragons. Mythical, flying, fire-breathing creatures. Yeah. But, like, when I was saying, like, the ones that had, like, the long neck and almost like the horse face, I was talking about the mid-age. The middle ages? Yeah. Princess, knight, dragon... Uh, that is that is pretty much St. George and the Dragon to a T. Yeah. And I think that's going to do it for us this episode. Unless you have anything else there, Elias. Um, I'm going to say if you ever find something that's uh, like a bone, you could possibly try to find out what bone it is. And if you find out that it's a dragon bone, then you're in luck. Actually, real quick, I mean, I'm curious. What's your favorite kind of dragon? Chinese. Chinese? Why? Because it's so, like, it doesn't have wings. It can fly, and also it has a lion head, and it's also very, very skinny. Okay. See, I was I was already thinking back to Dungeons & Dragons again, so I was kind of thinking silver dragons were pretty cool, but that's a, a whole different ballgame. I haven't seen a silver dragon. I know. So, uh, I don't know if I'll like that, too. All right, and that's going to do it. Thanks for listening. I'm Elias. I'm Sean. And you've been listening to Kid Cryptid. Until next time.